I like, first of all, to define what we commonly understand by the term universal suffrage. Universal suffrage really embraces the basic concept of fairness. That is, that it should be free, equal, and universal. We all know that the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights are entrenched in our basic law and is reflected in our local law. And let me give you what I construe as free, equal, and universal. First of all, free. I think it must give genuine expression to the will of the people. And it must lead to an election outcome that genuinely reflects the popular will. What do we mean by equal? I think the, tradi the idea traditionally expressed is one person, one vote. That is, each vote must carry equal weight to satisfy the element of fairness, and so the vote of one elector must be equal to the vote of another. And finally, universal. I take this to mean that there must be the broadest reasonable pool of voters who are guaranteed the right both to participate in the voting and to participate in the election. Let me come now to the reservation under Article 25, which is a reason that an excuse that the government constantly throws out to suggest that there is some impediment to the introduction of full democracy in Hong Kong. The Green Paper seems to suggest that the reservation for Article 25 of the IPPCR reserves the right not to apply Article 25B on the right to vote by universal suffrage. Now, as you will recollect, this reservation was actually entered by the United Kingdom in the year 1976. And at that time, it truly reflected the actual situation in Hong Kong. But it did not prevent the United Kingdom from introducing various Legislative Council election reforms since 1985. Nor, indeed, has it prevented the Hong Kong SAR government from introducing various constitutional reforms since the handover. I pointed out earlier that the basic law incorporates the ICCPR. So, we are not free to interpret the meaning of universal suffrage in whatever way we like. Furthermore, the basic law promises Hong Kong people universal suffrage as the ultimate aim. And this promise originates from the basic law and not the IPPCR. And so any reservation to the IPPCR is simply irrelevant. The Green Paper then goes on to quote selectively from the comments of the United Nations Human Rights Committee on <coughs> Article 25 to support its thesis that no single political system or electoral method would be appropriate for all peoples and all states. This is a totally misleading statement. What the Green Paper fails to do is to make clear that whatever system is devised, it has to conform with the international requirement of universal and equal suffrage. Let me now come out, come on to the general principles that are set out in the Green Paper. I've already said that the Green Paper comprises a confusing array of options. But to make matters worse, these so-called options is prefaced by a chapter, which is chapter two, that is devoted entirely to setting up the so-called principles of design of a political structure. But in fact, I suspect that the real purpose is to dampen public expectations of the outcome of the public consultation for example, in paragraph 2.08 of the Green Paper, this is stated, and I quote, Given the constitutional status of the Hong Kong SAR, the central government have the constitutional powers and responsibilities to determine the model of political structure of the Hong Kong SAR. End of quote. So it is little wonder, as I have pointed out earlier, that the community feels more and more resigned to the fact 
that it will not be up to the people of Hong Kong to indicate their wishes, but it will be up to the central government to tell us what will happen. Of greater concern to me is the fact that the Green Paper actually introduces new principles and implied preconditions to attaining universal suffrage, which have no authority either in the basic law or more recent interpretations and decisions by the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress. And I quote you the specific section of the Green Paper. In Chapter 2, there is outlined four so-called principles that will govern constitutional reform. The four principles include meeting the interests of different sectors of society, the so-called balanced representation, and second, facilitating the development of a capitalist economy. Those of you who are familiar with the basic law will know that the basic law actually enshrines only two fundamental principles. The first, gradual and orderly progress, and the second, that it must reflect the actual situation of Hong Kong. No more, no less. So the two principles that I have quoted just now have actually no constitutional basis. So why has it been presented as such to the people of Hong Kong? Let me now come out to a very brief analysis of what I believe should govern the election of the chief executive and the election of members of the Legislative Council. First of all, I think there is a general consensus emerging that the selection committee for the chief executive should be turned into a nominating committee in conformity with the basic law. Well and good. I believe that the size of the nominating committee is really not an important issue. Rather, the important thing is the way in which the electorate is going to be formed, whether it has a wide mandate, and in particular, whether there is going to be introduced a screening or filtering mechanism that will prevent the people from exercising a genuine choice. I believe that the guiding principle of the nominating committee must be to support achievement of election outcomes which give true expression to the popular will. It mustn't be a tool for screening out otherwise qualified candidates. The public must be able to choose between the policies and platforms of different candidates. For this reason, in March, I suggested a very simple, transparent system under which potential candidates are required only to receive nominations from no more than 10% of the committee members. So, if the size of the nominating committee remains at 800, candidates need only obtain 80 nominations. There is absolutely no valid reason for setting an artificial limit on how many candidates should be allowed to stand. And yet, that is one of the questions that the people are asked to answer in the Green Paper. As regards the composition and election of members of the Legislative Council, I think we all acknowledge that the fundamental and most difficult problem is what to do with functional constituencies. The first one I would like to make here is to point out that the United Nations Human Rights Committee, in examining a periodic report submitted by the Hong Kong government, expressly stated that the system of functional constituency in Hong Kong is an unreasonable restriction of the right to vote and is inconsistent with the principle of universal and equal suffrage. And so I believe, and I believe this view is shared by the majority of Hong Kong people, that in the long run, functional constituencies must go. The question then is whether we phase out the functional constituencies or whether we do it in one fell swoop. 